Welcome everyone to A House Divided. And uh, we're happy to have an old friend uh, to be with us today. And as I showed you, this is going to be the book. And we'll talk about uh, his new book on Lincoln and the immigration era. And as Bjorn said, you can see that we have book plates that Harold signed that are for today only. The day of release book plates. If you order it later on, if you're on YouTube and you're watching later, still want the book, please feel free. We'll get you a signed book plate as well. But as a limited edition for today, this is what we will have. Well, some people really don't need an introduction. The president, meaning Abraham Lincoln, uh, George Clooney, and our present <laughs> author, uh, formerly senior VP for public affairs at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, currently director of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College, winner of numerous prizes for writing and co-editing, about 56-ish, seven books? Six. Uh, okay, you're about halfway to Isaac Asimov, <laughs> uh, past chair of the Lincoln Centennial Commission, and he appears everywhere, Lincoln's Bicentennial on February 12th. I almost thought it was his birthday. He was more than Lincoln. Uh, and now with his most recent book, really a fabulous book, I've enjoyed this, and it's called Brought Forth on This Continent, Abraham Lincoln and the American Immigration. It's a Dutton book, an imprint of Penguin Random House, it's 455 pages and illustrated and is $35 and worth every penny. What I love about this book, Harold, by the way, is that it's both wonderful for reading, the amount of information, but also then for research. This is going to go right in the middle of that. One is going to be researching immigration in Lincoln's period. First of all, you've done it, but they're going to come to your book positively. I want to ask you, before we get into this, though, about the uh, Lincoln image that you have here. as of Matthew Brady, January 8th of 64, uh, Ostendorf 84, and I'm glad it wasn't retouched. It bears all the imperfections yeah. of the original. So why this image for the cover? Are you running out of Lincoln photos to use or what? Well, I have to say, and by the way, thank you. Thank you for having me back. Um, it's always great to talk to you. Uh, there's no one who knows more about Lincoln or Lincoln books than Daniel Weinberg, and he's been a friend for what is it, 50 years? 50 -ish years. At least 50 years. Yeah. So anyway, which is depressing in itself, not because we've been friends, <laughs> because we're old Thank friends, you. as you just said. Um, so the, the, the publisher came to me with this image and said, what do you think? And I said, you could not have chosen, and I don't know how, a more perfect image. This is the Lincoln as he looked while Congress was debating his proposal in his annual message for uh -huh. radical immigration reform. Uh -huh. He proposed it in December. They began the hearings in late December, January. They took out his most um, um, innovative proposal, which was to pay for transatlantic passage for new immigrants, even if they didn't join the army. But then they adjudicated it, they passed it, and he signed it on July 4th. So because the fact that there are imperfections sort of symbolically suggests for the reader and for me, it wasn't his dream bill. It was had its imperfections around the edges, just like this picture. I'm so glad you, only you, would ask this question. It's a perfect question. And by the way, if people are listening and are saying, wait a minute, you mean a president proposed a bill, Congress had committee meetings, they passed different versions, then they reconciled, and then the president signed. We've never heard of such a thing. Right now, Congress does an immigration bill. They pass it, and then they say, we never heard of it before. It was a Rod it's Sterling been... episode, obviously. <laughs> I know. We had a system once, as this book suggests. Anyway, I'm so glad you mentioned the picture. I love the way it looks, too. It does look. It looks great. I love his I, I, If I had hair like that, I would be such a star. Lincoln, that's his best. Well, hair. he was made up for that. You know what his hair was. But I, but it was beautifful. Brillo pad. 
Yeah, but this was great. He looked great. Well, listen, there are many reasons for immigration in the 19th century, differing ones that you start to write about in here. Mm -hmm. And let's get to some general questions before we get into the book itself. Um, some of those reasons you give were for the Irish came over mainly for economic reasons, the Swedes for religious reasons, Germans political. Um, and of course, you also talk that we can't forget displacement and deportation has to be considered along with this. And, so, forced, and forced emigration of Black people up until 1808. So, and then the illegal go. slave trade. So maybe expand on these reasons, if they yeah. made a difference here in America amongst the groups that they, when they interacted here, because they came for various reasons, is that part of the reasons maybe there was some contretemps between them? Yeah, I think it inspired it, although I think the main reason for the pushback was that so many Catholics were coming. And this was a self-described Protestant country. And again, the, as you put it, the, the immigrants of the 1840s and through the war were coming for either food or freedom. Um, Ireland is the only country in Europe to lose population in the 19th century. The potato famine was just crippling. And even if the potatoes grew, they had to ship them to England. It was an oppressed and oppressive situation. So we had millions of Irish immigrants coming from 1844, 5 on through 1860. The Germans, of course, and others, Italians, um, uh, French, some French, but are um, conflicted about the rise of um, autocratic rule, about the rise of or the defeat of democratic uh, revolutions and and uh, aspirations, the return of autocracy in France, in Germany, in Italy, which came close to having a republic and then went back to a monarchy. So they're coming to the United States. Uh, and Lincoln, of course, is an early supporter of the concept that America should be spreading democracy, right? He says he, will, he wants America to light the world. But when that fails, we've got to hold up the beacon the way the Statue of Liberty ultimately did. And yes, a lot of pushback. The first Germans are coming um, um, for food more than freedom. So 1830s, and they're mostly Catholic. Then the German Protestants start coming in. So uh -huh. everybody begins fighting with everybody, as has been happening ever since. Ever since. Well, it's very, always the very other. small, very small number of Jews are coming in although I do write about them. that has been handled so beautifully in other books, but I wanted to touch on them. Well, yeah, you had to because they were immigrants, but that became that came later in the 19th century, the large push for large that. Push, yeah. uh, where were the points of entry for most of them? Uh, I know there were some in the north, some in the south. Were there, were there different populations going north or south? Yeah. And were they accepted differently in the south versus the north? You, you ask a lot of great questions at once. Let me try. So the first, the easiest is the preponderant number are going to the north. It's got to be about 10 to 1 to the yeah. north. And of those, 70% come to New York City, to Castle Garden, which was a you know an entertainment venue and a landing station. And Boston and Philadelphia are the other principal ports of entry. Some go to the south. and But I think immigrants got it in their heads right away that there's not as much economic opportunity in the South. It, it's a more of a fixed system um, with slavery and uh, the elite owning slaves, very limited opportunity. The North has neither slavery nor limits. And I should say, speaking of limits, um, by the way, New York becomes 50% foreign born by 1860. Today, it's only 36%. But to listen to some of my fellow New Yorkers, you'd think there was an alien invasion out of a Spielberg movie. It's it's not what it was in the 19th century. Um, wait, what was my what was the third part of your intriguing multi? Well, was there a difference between how they were accepted? Even uh, there were less in the South. Judah Benjamin was accepted, but maybe because he was Jewish and. No one politically thought he could become president above them. So sure, use him. He married a very rich woman. And helped. Converted. That helped his status for sure. And he was a lawyer. Um, 
the acceptance was different in different cities. Um, most of the major northern cities ultimately had ethnic rioting way before the draft riots. In fact, Lincoln's first public statements on immigration um, are triggered by a, an 1844 bloody anti-Catholic uprising in Philadelphia, uh, burning of churches, the destruction of holy books, all because the Catholics said, "May we, pl we know we have to do a daily prayer in our schools. Mightn't we please read a daily prayer from the Catholic liturgy and not the King James Bible? And, and that triggered um, this violence that the governor had to put down with the state militia. And the Whigs were generally blamed for being in the anti-immigrant camp. So in Springfield, Illinois, a meeting was hastily called among Whigs to issue a statement for all Whigs everywhere. And Lincoln, being the best writer in the group, was called on to draft it. And it's the first time he speaks out on the issue. And he says, um, we should not throw anything in the way of people coming into this country. We yeah. want them. They're equal. They should be treated equally, no matter what their religion. All he asked was that they learn a little bit about America. Uh, well, let me ask you this then. Uh, what was uh, naturalization at that time? You, you touched upon the annual message of 1863, uh, and he's kind of set up an immigration process. Right. What was it like? Was there a time period? Did you have to take a quiz? Do you have to take an oath? I presume. I know, uh, absolutely. So what so, was that naturalization? And did he also set up at that time the first Federal Bureau of Immigration? The, I'll do the easy part first. He set up the first Federal Bureau. William Seward insisted that it be part of the State Department. And that's the way it was legislated. And then within months, it became an independent Federal Bureau. But here's the important thing. And people are going to be taken aback by this. I was, I guess. Um the Constitution gives the federal government zero oversight over immigration. The only thing that the feds are allowed to do, in the, if, you're, if you're an originalist, take heed, you can only control naturalization. And the original federal rule, congressionally mandated, was if you're in for two years, you can become a citizen. Then they change it to five. Then in, in the Alien and Sedition Acts, they increase it to 14. But as soon as that law sunsets, when Jefferson becomes president, it goes back to five. There's no border patrol. There's no ICE. There's no uh, crossing the Rio Grande in secret. Anyone can come. It's totally open sesame. And five to 10 million people just come off ships, walk off, either reunite with their families or go west or north or south. And in five years, with few exceptions, they can simply go to the uh, naturalization or citizenship office and take an oath of allegiance, renouncing all citizenships, citizenship elsewhere. I don't know if you, you no doubt have heard the oath being given. It's a very tough oath. It's much stronger than any oath we ever took as native born Americans for allegiance and renunciation and taking up arms if called upon. Um, so it was really a borderless country. Uh, in the Lincoln era, as you pointed out, the crackdowns didn't begin until the 1880s. And that's because the Supreme the Supreme Court said, oh, we forgot about the Commerce Clause. So you can, the feds have, are taking over. It was state responsibility uh, and local responsibility to police new arrivals. The most that states did was charge a $1 head tax for new arrivals because and that wasn't punitive. It was because so many new arrivals had to go straight to group settings, you know, hospitals, group homes, not unlike refugees today. So they mm. collected a one dollar tax. Yeah. We should think of that doing that now. We make a lot of money if we have 10,000 yeah. people a day, charge a hundred dollars and we pay for some of the costs. Now, there's a sentence that caught my eye okay. uh, among many. I hope it's but this one uh, was about historical figures evolving. And you, I'd like you to explain the thought that this word has become a cliche too often deployed to excuse moral failure. So I'm still going to then ask the following question, and that is, overall, was there an evolving trajectory for Lincoln 
on his thoughts of immigration throughout his life. A brief overview. We have a lot to cover. Yeah, I think you're right. Maybe it's a cliche, but so is this idea. It was from your book. I just... Uh, yeah, no, no. I, I, flip-flopping became a cliche in the last part of our last century. And evolution became a way to describe the fact that people are supposed to grow up and become more informed, become more humane. And I think Lincoln evolved on slavery. He would not have issued an Emancipation Proclamation in 1850. Yeah. He would not have supported the 13th Amendment, maybe even in 1860. I think evolution morally and politically is a, is a great thing. And in the beginning, Lincoln was not as woke. <laughs> I thought I'd throw in another cliche as he became. And we can talk about it, but that's my brief headline answer. There were, um, behind me, actually, I have right here, George Templeton Strong's four-volume work, uh, Diary. Fascinating I it, stuff. I have it right here. So <laughs> There you go. It's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. But it was interesting that he was, as you point out, uh, more prescient than Lincoln in sensing that the Whigs would be defunct because of nativists in their midst. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's one thing. And then we got a message this morning by email from Jeffrey Boutwell, a descendant from George Boutwell, who was wow. in the House of Representatives from Massachusetts. And in March of 43, he was responding to derogatory comments, 43, about immigrants during a debate. And he retorted, quote, who in this community is not descended from foreigners? If foreigners came here ignorant, let them not be treated like enemies. The sooner they are placed upon a footing to exercise the rights and duties of citizenship, the better it will be for our community. So then Jeff Boutwell asked this question. As a member of the Democratic Party in the 1840s, Boutwell was more disposed to support immigration than Lincoln as a Whig might have been. Absolutely. I'm sure I'll learn this when reading your book, but how early did Lincoln begin voicing unequivocal support for immigrants in America? Oh, unequivocal took a while, Mr. Boutwell. And that is a very famous uh, remark. Uh, but we have to keep in mind politically, Democrats welcomed immigrants from the boat to the party registration office because Democrats joined the Democrats. Uh, 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 the Irish immigrant and the early Germans joined the Democratic Party because they felt unwelcome in the Whig Party. So it became a self-sustaining um, encouragement. Not that I'm denigrating the Batwell comments in any way. And by the way, speaking of what's right behind you, um, um, George Templeton Strong may have been more prescient than most, but I, I used one of his diary entries in which he says, we know the Democrats are going to do voter fraud for this New York election. So I went into a citizenship office and I was so offended by the smell of the Irish that I left. Huh. So he's pretty anti-Irish. And it and you hear it again during the draft riots when he says they're all Irish hooligans. And, and I was happy to see one of my elite friends beating up some Irish people today. So yes, the elite and most of the Whigs were elites and most of the elites were Whigs were not encouraging of immigration. Boutwell was typical of Democrats. Stephen Douglas uh, was gave a great speech in the 1840s about immigration in Philadelphia, the city where there were riots. What was Lincoln's first impactful association with an immigrant? Was it in New Orleans when he heard he was exposed to foreign languages? Uh, did that get him interested by chance in immigration? And in Springfield, I mean, the 1840s, as you suggest, a, a third of the residents were foreign born. So yeah. this had to have impacted somewhere in that time. Yeah, I think New Orleans is probably, I would say, his first exposure to foreign born people as opposed to impactful. We know, at least from the Hanks family, that the biggest impact of that trip was seeing a slave auction. Um, and I never want to say that immigration is... Um, the major issue of Lincoln's life. It, it's not. Slavery is always the big issue. But immigration is an issue that he dealt with. Um, so I think the most impactful early acquaintance was, was probably 
um, Gustav Kerner of Illinois, who was not a 48er. He came early to the United States and great books. I used these two, my mind these two books. Yeah. Can they be, um, are they, um, can they be thought of as correct? Uh, or did he uh, obfuscate? What Can we go this into what he says and say, yeah, that is probably what it was? Well, we don't have original diaries. And uh, he wrote it later in life. But, um, you know, his impressions of Lincoln and events match up with others that we know of. And just think, this is a, a a German who rises in the Illinois political ranks, becomes lieutenant governor of Illinois as a foreign-born, thickly accented foreigner, right? And um, who is in charge of the Republican convention that gavels into order and invites Lincoln to accept the Republican senatorial nomination in 58 with the Great House Divided speech? It's, it's Gustav Kerner. Lincoln later is not too nice to him, but that's a that's a whole other story. I think he was the first and uh, uh, the first foreign born person. And then there are others, Henry Villard and Carl Schurz, of course. Sure, we'll get to some of them a little later. Um, I did want to show, because we're now was kind of in a little bit earlier life of Lincoln. I wanted to show this wonderful photograph that anyone in the Lincoln world knows. Uh, this is what the animal really looked like with that Brillo <laughs> pad and and this tie from shoulder to shoulder is a borrowed coat. But this was taken here in Chicago by uh, von Schneidau, who was uh, foreign born, uh, Swedish, and had mm -hmm. and went back because of all the vapors of being a photographer. But uh, the German born George Schneider brought him to have this photograph taken holding the Illinois Staatszeitung which, which uh, was an abolitionist leaning paper from George Schneider. And Lincoln did hold it. I'm, I'm kind of surprised when I think about this, but let's talk about what this was. Thankfully, I think for him, it was solarized out. You can't really see what's there. Later, it was used four years later. This is 1854 and 58. Um, the Tribune here in Chicago put in their masthead to show that they're supporting. Right. Lincoln for senatorship. And what was the tribute at that time? It was a know-nothing anti-immigration paper. Interesting. Interesting. Exactly it. But he's holding that. And if the electorate had seen the masthead, they would have put Lincoln in the abolitionist camp. So it's probably good that it was solarized out. But you say it did help him align with the immigrants. And Schneider. It, was it effective? Yes. Was Schneider the photo was seen? Schneider was a big Lincoln booster. On February 22nd, 1856, Republican editors met in Decatur for a conference. And Schneider said, the first thing we have to do is draft a resolution supporting immigration before slavery. And this is to organize the new Republican Party. And Lincoln helped them draft a measure that could be passed by all of the editors. Actually, all. It was so snowy that very few editors showed up and they invited Lincoln to attend. He later became a newspaper editor of a German paper, as we know. But but uh, uh, so he drafted his first resolution. And I think Schneider was an important person in his life. The Stadtzeitung remained close to Lincoln until 1864 when they broke with him. But we'll get and to What that. happened with the Germans in 64? I, know, I think uh, emancipation, was that? The, yes, uh, emancipation had not reached Missouri, where so many Germans lived. It was a border state where not covered by the by emancipation. But I think a lot of it was very personal. Well, there was also the issue, a, a new issue for me. Germans were pro labor, and there were a lot of strikes in the country in early six, late sixty three, early sixty four, and Lincoln okayed the idea of the military. Um, ordering strikes to end and arresting labor leaders if strikes interfered with military capacity or supplies. And practically everything was related to military supplies. They didn't like that in Missouri. Most of all, I think it was purely emotional. Lincoln had, had and we haven't gotten to this point yet, so I'll just do this briefly. He had recruited Franz Sigel early in the Civil War, to be a, a poster boy for German volunteering. Sigel was a great choice. 
the Germans loved him. They admired him. I fight Smith Siegel became a, a big slogan uh, before they called him the Flying Dutchman because the best he ever did in battle was to retreat well. So ultimately, Lincoln didn't keep him in high command, and the Germans just resented it bitterly. And they ultimately came out for Fremont in 1864. Well, you know, the know-nothings uh, pre, uh, pre-Republican Party, uh, it was a fraught relationship that Lincoln had with them. Uh, I quote from your book, Lincoln was maddeningly torn between welcoming the foreign-born and befriending those who despise them. Uh, you know, the Steve Inskeep's book, Differ We Must, um, makes the point that Lincoln befriended those who disagreed with him uh, but and spoke with him more or less. Uh, so how did Lincoln navigate that fraught relationship with the know-nothings? Did he differ we must? Did he do that approach? Was that a tactic? That's a really good question. And I love Steve and I love his book. <clears throat> I don't think it was quite a case of being civil. I think Lincoln was being kind of backdoor. Those no, he calculated that the Nothing Party would not be a permanent party; that it was an expression of a rage that would die down. As we've learned in our time, rage movements don't die down that easily. Um, so Lincoln, Lincoln wanted the Know Nothings, who were disaffected Whigs with nowhere to go. He wanted them to join the anti-slavery coalition, ultimately, which became the New Republican Party. He was always talking about getting them, uh, recruiting them, fusing with them, hopefully on my grounds, he said. Um, I would fuse with anybody, he said, um, to to uh, Owen Lovejoy. But it also meant that he never denounced the Know Nothing movement specifically. And Stephen Douglas would rile people up by saying, you know, Lincoln's for Black voters, but he's not for Irish voters. He doesn't think white people should have a universal right to vote, just Black people, which, of course, was also an exaggeration. So Lincoln really worked to thread the needle on the Know Nothing movement. And some of what he did is not attractive. I mean, we, he had a Know Nothing delegation come and visit him. Um, they, they were like interviewing him when he was running for Senate in 55. Matt Pinsker discovered this uh, conversation, a wonderful Lincoln scholar. Um, and um, he said, what are the know-nothings? What are, what are Native Americans anyway? All I know about Native Americans is that one of them killed my grandfather. I mean, he was like making light of it. He never took a stand. He wanted his allies. He even asked Gustav Kerner once, be sure you work on the know-nothings to get them to vote for me. I mean, that's like, that's a pretty insulting request. Um, and I will, are you going to ask me a question about his speed letter or should I volunteer it here? Go right ahead. So he, every Lincoln biographer of the last hundred years has said, Lincoln was of course opposed to nativism. Look at his great letter to Joshua Speed, his best friend in 1855. Speed must have written to him. Lincoln didn't save any of Speed's letters, either on sex, marriage, or politics, unfortunately. He was the worst archivist in history he, until he got John Nicolay. Excuse me, though. Did, did Robert find them and burn them? No. No. Okay. They, and nor did Larry Kramer find them, just saying. Okay. Because Larry Kramer told everybody he found Lincoln's love letters. And I finally got to talk to him before he died. And he said he made it up, just which I hope will be in a friend's new Larry Kramer biography. In fact, I insist on it. But anyway, um, so he writes to Speed must have said, what is it with you and the know nothings? And that's my invention of the incoming correspondence. Lincoln famously writes, I am not a know nothing. How, um, how could I be? How can anyone who fights against the degradation of black people be accused of degrading white people? When it comes to, you know, um, you know I'd rather go to Russia than to degrade people in the United States. It's a very famous letter. And it's always cited to you say, see, Lincoln wasn't a nativist. But who got to see that letter? Joshua Speed and That's nobody it. else, not for a long time. He wrote the same sentiment a week earlier to Owen Lovejoy. And the, and he said kind of the same thing, also private and confidential, but more like- Does likely. he put private on it? Yes, I think so. That's yeah. a good question. 
Um, I'm not going to look at collected works. Maybe he wanted some of it to leak out because he also said, I will fuse with anybody. The know-nothings are not entirely beaten to the dust. We may need them. So to Lovejoy, he says the same thing, I am not a know-nothing, but he also holds out the possibility of differing we must, but uniting on anti-slavery. Gotcha. It's, it's complicated. And we should always be careful to read behind the lines in, in both Lincoln correspondence and Lincoln's views. I, and and he's not alone. I mean, Salmon Chase said, we have enough enemies. Let the know nothing support me in Ohio. I'm not going to stop them. I'm worried about slavery. Um, Thaddeus Stevens was sympathetic to nativists. Nathaniel Banks in Massachusetts was really sympathetic to nativists. People who later became bulwarks in the anti-slavery movement hmm. because they wanted those converts to join them. This is what we're talking about. And this is a wonderful book by Harold. And right now, if you order this today only, you can get this uh, release day, day of release. And it's like a limited edition, only those bought today. Otherwise, you will have it without that line, which is not bad either. You'll get a good book, a first edition still, and uh, with a wonderful signed book plate. Sometime we'll get you back here uh, you may be coming to April. We can see, we'll see what we can do here in Chicago. I hope so. It, it's interesting that uh, talking about the Irish, we've talked about them a bit, and they made up uh, 43, in 1850, they made up 43% of the foreign born, and of course, a majority in the Catholic Church. Uh, here in Chicago, it's taken a while for this to take place. We had when uh, ex-mayor, the father, Daly, uh, was uh, was mayor here. The, the phrase was, take the Ryan Expressway through Daly City, down the Kennedy Expressway to O'Hare Airport and up to Irish heaven. <laughs> well, it was not until... I never heard that. That's great. And I never even thought of O'Hare as an Irish name. Yeah, Obviously yeah. it is, yeah. So um, it, it took them a while to get uh, inculcated here, but it's interesting that I don't think Lincoln could do this today as a politician, but he used Irish jokes quite a bit. He His did. first immigrant jokes were about them. How did that come about? Uh, did he joke about other immigrants as well? You have some wonderful ones in the book, and could that have been, I'm, this is speculation, uh, some residual or cultural anti-Catholicism, even in Lincoln? You know, I found that the really consistent thing about Lincoln's attitude toward the foreign born is if the foreign born were potentially supportive of Abraham Lincoln, then Abraham Lincoln embraced them. He made a couple of German jokes with, with accents. But you know, the Irish just joined up en masse to the Democratic, with the Democratic Party. And so all of the stereotypes, drinking, um, sort of kind of stupidity, uh, not understanding that frogs were not canon, being afraid of the noise of frogs. That was, uh, but, you know, it, one of Lincoln's favorite jokes, he used all throughout the Civil War when he meant, do what you want, but don't tell me. And just don't tell me about it. Let Jefferson Davis escape. Put in the order evacuating areas of... Uh, uh, you know, the, the 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 famous orders displacing people, not the Jews, the other order, number 11. Just don't tell me about it. And the story is of an Irishman who goes on the wagon and doesn't drink. And then he goes to a picnic and they offer him lemonade because they know he's now a teetotaler. And he said, yes, and if you want to put a little dram in, it's OK with me if it's unbeknownst to me. Lincoln yeah. would li like the idea. And that that's... Um, that's about this cartoon, which is a great Thomas Nass cartoon, is about Michael Corcoran, early recruit into the Union Army, beloved by the Irish because um, he had refused to assemble the 69th Regiment to salute the Prince of Wales when he visited New York. He said, I would rather be court-martialed than, than pay homage to the heir to the British throne. So he was court-martialed. Hmm. And it was being ready for trial in 1861 when Lincoln and the Archbishop of New York, John Dagger John Hughes, thought that Michael Corcoran would be an ideal 
inspiring magnet for recruitment, the way Franz Sigel was for Germans in the West. So Corcoran reorganized the 69th. They conveniently dropped his court-martial, and he marched off to fight and ultimately be captured at Bull Run. Because as it often happened, these ethnic symbols just somehow didn't cut it on the battlefield. I wanted to ask you about artifact usage. Maybe this is a good moment. Um, as you know, we deal in artifacts. You have been a collector throughout your life, so you understand them. And how? what is their use to you as an historian and, and in researching your books? What is the use of artifacts? You just looked at a cartoon that certainly gave you information and the Thomas Marr oil of the return of the 69th. Yeah. New York is in there. Great painting. Well, Give even us more than, I'll tell you one. Um, and, and I found, by the way, I don't think anybody's found this. And, you know, it's the kind of thing maybe, Dan, that only you and I will love. But I found the photograph that he posed for, uh, uh, that 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 Marr posed for, that the, the artist, Louis Lang, German, there it is. obviously used for, for the painting. So no. this is not exactly a, a spontaneous gesture. No. Yeah, artifacts are key. And I want to tell you about one. Um, I went to an event in 2013, the 150th anniversary of the draft riots, and it was hosted by Cardinal Dolan. Um, and he he was he was he's very interested in American history. He beckoned me over and he said, Do you know what I'm wearing? And you know, for a nice Jewish boy from New York, I knew he was wearing a cross, but I don't know what I'm supposed to say. So I said, it's beautiful. And he said, he lifted it up off the chain and he said, this is what Archbishop Hughes wore and held up to stop Catholics from attacking Protestant churches during the draft rites. And I thought, now there is a relic that speaks to the, the visceral history of violence, of racism, of religious turmoil, of the power of a prince of the church, almost like in a movie, in a, a you know a horror movie, you hold up that cross and people just stop what they're doing. And I just thought that that was probably the best Civil War relic, I've, unknown Civil War relic I've ever seen. But yeah, you can't write a book like this without not only consulting online, which is very tempting these days because it's, I wrote much of this book and researched it during the lockdown. So I had to rely on sources, but I, I just want to see those original pamphlets. I want to touch them. I want to you see the pens that were used. Yesterday, I got to see a table that was in a courtroom that Abraham Lincoln practiced law in. It's in the Union League Club in New York, mislabeled as being a relic of Lincoln's law office. I said to my host, I didn't want to be rude. I said, this was used probably in a courtroom not in the, they, oh no, look at the piece of paper. It says it was in his law office. I said, his law office was probably about three inches longer than this table. I don't think they would have used it, but it's, believe me, it's a great and important piece. You just ought to do more research on it. Well, artifacts are just amazing. Uh, and, you know, I, I touch them every day. I'm, I'm honored to touch them every day. And they come here sometimes, you know, I, I did a, a take a break with history segment uh, about a month ago on one of the panels, state panels, that was a witness to the 20 days it took Lincoln's coffin from Washington to uh, Springfield because it was lined, the car on the inside was lined with the seals of every state in the Union. And, uh, and one walked in my shop from Delaware. Only three of those are around. And there's nothing, I mean, it's just so emotional to yeah. do that. Let me ask you something I, I wanted to I want to find out about too. Diaries and letters. Americans were generally pretty literate. Uh, Crimean War soldiers, by the way, also wrote quite a bit. But as a war, both sides are pretty literate. They maybe didn't do well with grammar or spelling, but they could get their thoughts across. What about the immigrants? Were they uh, literate? Did they write diaries? A lot of letters as well. That's a, that's a good question. I would say less so. And I always go back to the literacy of the correspondence in the Civil War by saying the literate soldiers were literate, but there were others who didn't write. And that's the, un, that's the unknown but logical part of the story. Yes, they wrote to each other. I would say the preservation quotient for 
German soldiers is is low. Um, I, the letters of Irishmen have been preserved and beautifully edited in volumes of correspondence, as has have some German soldier letters. And it's, you know, it's always revealing to know about people's small prejudices and worries and concerns. They're the same as soldiers who were born in the United States. They're worried about their pay. They're worried about dying. They're worried about showing their comrades that they're afraid. They're worried about their sweethearts and their mothers back home. And they're initially upset about fighting to free Black people. Um, yeah. And then they come around on that, or at least the Germans do. Was there a different approach, do you think, from the immigrants versus those who had already been here? Did they did they embrace, uh, this is kind of getting off that, uh, did they embrace our founding fathers? My father came out of Ukraine and he came here and he gave numerous talks through his life. And he always spoke about our forefathers, our yeah. fathers said, dad, you were, you know, I was born here. You weren't. And, but that's assimilation. Yeah. Well, the Germans here talk more about the fatherland than the Irish. It's interesting. Right. Um, the Irish felt so uh, oppressed that they were eager to shed the mantle of being, you know, under the yoke of the British. The Germans, you know, they started gymnasiums. They started um, uh, political clubs. Uh, people were suspicious of their movements and their cooking even. Why don't they cook apple pie? The Germans would write back, you know, we don't want to cook apple pie. We want to keep, we want to cook mince pie and sauerkraut and the things that we like. Um, we want to oh. bring beer. And they said, what's beer? And then the Irish said, this is not bad. So <laughs> there was a little bit of intersection over ale and lager, but the Germans were a little more clannish, and that 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 even when they stopped being largely Catholic, that caused some resentment. I I I I'm an, I'm going to answer your question now with some specificity, not relic driven, unless you can hold the old newspaper. In April '61, a few days after Sumter, a few days after Lincoln called for volunteers, there was a massive rally at Union Square under the statue of George Washington. That's now in the park. Then it was south of the park. Um, and the flag of Sumter was draped over Washington's sword, the actual flag of Sumter. And, and Major Anderson was there. It was kind of two rallies. One was New York elites. And then on the other side of the park, Germans and Irish had their own part of the rally and everyone turned to them. And it's exactly as you said, speaker after speaker said, I come from Ireland or I come from Germany. I love my old country. I love my old country. But when I came here, I swore allegiance to this country and this flag, and I will fight for it and I will die for it. The Irish, I am not an Irishman. I am an American. I am not a Democrat or a Republican. I'm going to fight for this country. The Irish would add, do I like Abraham Lincoln? No, I didn't vote for him. I didn't want him to be president. But here's something novel for society. He is my president and I will obey him and will proudly follow him. So, and then Lincoln hearing that, reading these reports begins to recruit Irish regiments, um, multi-ethnic regiments, German res regiments, and it's key to the war effort. Are you mainly saying then that the motivation of these newly minted Americans to go out and perhaps lose their lives and limbs on the battlefield. They took an oath for their new country and that meant something to them. Yeah. Irish, Germans, Swedes, whatever. Not, not all of them have taken the oath yet too. Some of them were here. I mean, if you think about it, we, I talked for a minute ago about uh, Henry Villard and his influential writing. He met, he was a Douglas man in 1858. Uh, then he, wrote articles about Lincoln when he was president-elect. In 58, when he's writing pro-Douglas pieces for the German papers in New York, in German, after all, his name was Heinrich Villard till he anglicized it, he, um, he wasn't a citizen yet. If he was, he was just a citizen. He'd only been in the United States for five years. These people were assimilating so quickly. And again, just to emphasize, there was no birthright citizenship. There was no razor wire, there was no ice, people, and, and there were no work permits, or you can't work because you don't have papers. People went right to work. I shouldn't say right to work because that's another phrase. They went immediately to work and benefited their families. 
so they didn't have to be on the public dole and they benefited the national economy as well. Tell us, a, this is a short story, but just to mention it, because it comes into this, the Daniel Crotty story, uh, I think that's how you pronounce it, seeing Lincoln in his cabinet and what sort of oh. experience he had being nationalized just by that. Oh, you have to remind me. That he saw the cabinet in Washington with Lincoln. And that, he himself said, was a nationalizing experience. He oh, saw yes. the government oh, this uh, is the right in front of him. The soldier who wanders by and sees General Scott and the president and That's the it. cabinet. By yeah. the way, it's been proven that that probably never happened. He, I don't know what he saw, but he saw something. Yes, I believe these were nationalizing moments. They were thrilled. Then there's a story about some German soldiers who, from Ohio who are wandering around, you know, after a night on the town. They got leave, I hope. And they see a man leaning against a tree. We know that Lincoln did that because there's a... Um, a uh, a paint a, a sketch of him leaning against a tree in Washington. He uh, holding a cane, the same as he was described by these guys. And they looked at him and they said, "Can it be? Are you?" And he said, "Boys, where are you from?" I said, "We're from Ohio." He said, "Well, carry on and thank you." And they walked up the street, not believing that they had just spoken to the president. And they went got to see. There was a guard at the next gate, and they said, "Is that?" And he said. Well, I'm not supposed to tell you, but he sometimes goes for an evening stroll. Yeah, we don't, you know, to see a president today is very hard. Um, and it it's it's always uplifting, no matter who the president is. And thank goodness now, for the time when people could see them. In the war years, uh, we know that Lincoln needed immigrants for large armies and also for the workforce, as you mentioned earlier on. Um, did perceptions of immigrants change? I mean, you know, for instance, later in the war, when freedmen started to be put into their own colored regiments uh, and white soldiers at least saw them fight well, they may not wanted them uh, like Lincoln to marry their sisters, but at the same time, they accepted them a little bit more because of that. Did the same thing happen with all these foreign voices that earlier Americans heard and they saw what they did, brought them First, around. I, I find it amusing that army regulations at the start of the Civil War required that all soldiers speak English and they just ignored it and then changed it. I mean, kind of hard to the chain of command to give orders if it's, if it's a, bab, a Tower of Babel situation. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that it's interesting. I think respect for the Irish was less at the beginning of the war and more at the end of the war. It helps that Robert E. Lee calls them the fighting Irish. It helps that they are so decimated and at Fredericksburg on Maurice Heights and at Gettysburg. And the Germans, it's, it's a little bit different. They're more pro-Union at the beginning, certainly more pro-Lincoln. But there are episodes where Germans are brutally criticized. First of all, both groups are criticized for drinking too much through the whole war. Um, in, at Chancellorsville, Carl Schurz, who has come back from being ambassador to Spain um, and is leading a regiment, he his men bolt at Chancellorsville and apparently abandon artillery pieces that the Confederates capture. You should read the articles, not only... And there's a pre-war shirts with his wife, Margareta. Um, you the 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 um the vitriol by the New York Times, the New York Tribune, and of course the New York Herald about German troops. They these people should be drummed out of the service, they should be executed, said Horace Greeley, for abandoning their position. So the Germans got less approbation as the war went on, which is interesting. Uh, kind of skipping around here because that's what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> here is uh, Lincoln's lost speech by uh, Chrissy and uh, our late friend Lloyd Ostendorf did this wonderful oil of what it was like. I just had a question because uh, in chapter four, the, in a footnote there, uh, I was wondering if, if the question came to me, didn't, and you said, no one took notes, and that's why it's the lost speech. But I thought I'd read or heard somewhere that Herndon, who was there, 
had taken some types of notes and that's how he got some idea of what he was saying. Do you know yay or nay on that? I, I think Hernan was there. I don't think he took reliable notes. I don't trust half of the things William Hernan says. Anyway, I know it's much more fashionable now to accept him as the absolute <laughs> authority on Lincoln's pre-war life without question, although he had a lot of biases. I I find it really hard to believe that that no one recorded the speech, but more to the point, there was not a lot of stenographic reporting until the Lincoln-Douglas debates two years later. So I don't know what they expected these reporters to do since shorthand wasn't in common usage. More yeah, yeah. likely, I think, Abraham Lincoln handled the manuscript the way he handled every manuscript until, until he became a, the presidential candidate in 1860. He wrote it, he used it, and that was it. Maybe he withheld it from the press. That's the only excuse I, I, I can imagine. I don't think he would have given a speech like that without writing it out first. He didn't trust himself with extemporaneous speaking. Yeah. Um, I think he, he, did, probably, he did that with some Indians, Native Americans, who came into the White House, Comanches and a few others. Yeah, well, that's not his most elegant set of speech. But it's a very interesting speech. Very interesting. Uh, because you see him finally as a real 19th century man. He said that we're not as warlike as our red brothers, even though we're in Forget about war. those 400,000 soldiers who were dead at that point. Well, and also forget about the uh, Crusades and the Hundred Years no, of when he War. Spoke and... in, he spoke like an early Western. I mean, he said, you red man, I big white chief, you know, stuff like That's that. That's exactly By the way, it. I got to write about that, not only because in this book, not only because I wanted the thread to always be there, that Lincoln is welcoming immigrants at the same time he's agreeing to the displacement of Native peoples and the containment of Native peoples. But I found a great way to do it, quite by accident. Lincoln goes to see a German opera in Washington, I think at the National Theater. It, Mary liked German opera better than Italian opera. So they went to this German, probably a Faust, probably Faust, and he goes backstage, like VIPs still do, to meet the cast. And he met one guy who, it was a German traveling company. And he spoke to one spear carrier who he just particularly took a shine to. And they tried to talk German. Lincoln had once tried to learn German. He was a failure at it. They spoke a little bit. And Lincoln said to him, and maybe a translator helped or didn't, he said, you must come and visit me at the White House. So this German chorus guy, goes to the White House when the Indians come to talk to Lincoln in the East Room. And he witnesses it. He said, I came to the White House. I never believed that I would be ushered into this majestic room and see these red men gathered. It was the most interesting. I must come back. Well, I think that was probably the last visit, but people could just wander in. And he, he must have said, Lincoln asked me to come. And they assumed he was a journalist or an expert. So that's how I got to tell that story in the book. Did, I mean, this was not his primary thing. It was keeping the union and slavery. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, today, many uh, excoriate Lincoln for hanging 30 plus Indians all at once, even though 300 more were uh, let go. And these were the worst of the lot. And he kind of had to do that. Now, there's... You know, Robert E. Lee at Appomattox saw Ellie Parker, was introduced to Ellie Parker, a Seneca Indian on Grant's staff, and he backed away until he was told, this is a Native American. He said, came up and shook his hand, allegedly, and said, at least there's one real American in the room. Well, did Lincoln ever see the irony of he, his descendants, and everyone else as we was strong did, we're all all immigrants, and the only ones that aren't are the natives. He did not see the irony. And by the way, you forgot Ellie Parker's final word, which is "General, today we're all Americans." If only that was if that was true. true. I don't think he saw the irony. Lincoln's the only stories Lincoln knew about his ancestry was that his that were that of those involving. His grandfather, Abraham Lincoln, was killed by Indians, as he put it. And he, he must have come across some in southern Indiana. No, but but None? he comes across them in the Black Hawk War. Of course, he well, volunteers. I have to say. Different story. I have to say. Well, he sees people who were scalped, and he sees friendly yeah. Indians 
who the soldiers want to kill because they haven't killed any. He stopped them. He stopped them. I'll tell you a, a story a little off topic, but it's I want to pay tribute to someone. So I sent the story, my chapter, not really expecting a real reading, but, but he's my good luck charm, to Wayne Temple in Springfield, Illinois. Wow. He was 98 and change at the time. And he read this, the chapter about Lincoln and he wrote back, he wrote notes all over it. Then he calls me and he says, you know, everyone says Lincoln joined the state militia. I've proven beyond doubt that he it wasn't the state militia, it was the home guard. You have to say it was the home guard. You can't. So I said, sure. And I'll footnote you and say, anyway, I mentioned him because my, we have the same birthday. It's also Nancy Hanks's birthday. We're all born on February 5th. And if I felt old on February 5th, because I was 75, which was a milestone, I felt young and awed by the fact that I called Wayne on that day on his 100. Actually, he called me. <laughs> Took too long. He said, You didn't call me. I just had a party for me at Springfield. They took me to the Rotary Club, 100 years old, and his mind is still the sharpest attack. And he's the second Lincoln scholar I know who's lived to be 100. So, Dan, there is hope for us. If yeah, we, the two of us. If let's we wanted. Well, let's meet on the other side. <laughs> but I'm going to have to hold on until you get there. That's the problem. Well, they're not going to the other side. Wayne is on our side. He's staying there, and it's amazing. I want to ask you about land grants Yeah, um, that I don't have. I, I was just in San Francisco for a show and I had brought the land grant signed by Stoddard, Lincoln. Signed oh, yeah, none. that's right. He was the Interior Department guy. That's right. And Stoddard signed them all for Lincoln. Um, it wasn't so easy, then, by the way. It was on slick paper. Those were hard to do. As he wrote, they were, they were hard to get the ink to it here. On the well, that's on the vellum. Yeah, Not on the vellum. Much on land grants; those were paper. Okay, rag rag paper. Um, the you know, if America had anything; it was land. And now Ben Franklin was opposed to them as giving land to strangers. He didn't want to do that. Right. What was Lincoln's view? He certainly gave out a lot of land at his time. What was his view on? giving land to strangers. And here is another of those ironies that pop up is that Lincoln specifically wanted immigrants, the foreign born to have access to the homestead lands under the same terms. And then he put it in the legislation or he introduced it in the legislation in which he wanted to pay for the passages of immigrants and exempt them from the draft, but include them in the Homestead Act. So the, the lost irony, again, is that some, most of these lands are native lands that have been appropriated. Mm. Or we say appropriated or taken or ceded by the, the, the American Indians. So, yeah, it's a com we have a complicated history, I think. But he definitely wanted foreigners and, and naturalized Americans to be eligible for a homestead if they farmed it the same way and cleared it and improved it the same way that native-born Americans, except for Indians, were expected to do. It was interesting when you got to the when I got to the chapters on uh, uh, Lincoln's death and the execution and the trial of the conspirators. Yeah, all, and I've written on that with James Swanson, and all of a sudden it kind of did dawn on me from your book. They're all they're all <laughs> you know Lincoln Lincoln dies in the home of a German. Um, um, Heart triumphed was first generation of German parents. Yeah, he I was the head of it. And the executioner. Um, Scottish and born and Alexander Gardner. Astorot. Um, I was just in, oh, I don't have that here. Uh, maybe I do. Maybe Bjorn has a picture of Mary Surratt's grave, which on the way to the forum last November, I stopped at a Catholic cemetery in uh, Washington. And fascinating to be there. Uh, it's just a tombstone done later. Yeah. Uh, just says Mrs. Surratt, that's it. And a couple of hills away uh, is Henry Words, who was hanged from uh, Andersonville. The only Astorot the only... was a German American, Boston Corbett. We should, tell, we should remind British. everyone about who Henry Words was. He was the hair commandant at Andersonville prison, and the one person executed for war crimes, also born. In, in Germany. Yeah, and, but 
all these people. Gustav Kerner was a pallbearer in Springfield. So it's amazing uh, how many immigrants or first generations from them and, and uh, ones of the, the, were populating yeah. around these. Oh, yes. And when Lincoln's body lay in state in New York City, Thomas Francis Marr, the Fenian Brotherhood guy who had come home from Bull Run and then reorganized the Irish regiment while Corcoran was still in southern prisons, um, Marr was standing at attention at the foot of the coffin. And as I write, a, a, a teenage art student who was born in Ireland, came and looked at, waited online to see the body. And then I think he later exaggerated, went back online so he could see it again. And that was Augustus St. Gaudens who, who, uh, who sculpted Lincoln so beautifully for Chicago. So yeah, the immigrant experience was different and the tolerance was different for all of the pushback against the Irish and the Germans. There was still this inevitability that they would join society and mm. that their forebearers would become Americanized. I was thinking about this whole thing when I was writing this question, and I thought, gee, it also, the assassination also produced two immigrants to another country, Prussia, when Henry Rathbone and Mary Harlan oh. <laughs> left 15 years later. Well, so did Mary. Mary became an expat, too. Yeah, she did. Remember that. So, she went um, right over. I meant Racine, but also overseas. No, that is, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. But That's there's so many, you know, I made a little list of some of the interesting people. Uh, you mentioned Henry Villard. And this book is just replete with interesting people, yeah. interesting stories, yeah. minor, well-known. And that's why one reads this, I think. And they all have good quotes. Uh, now, Henry Villard, as you mentioned, was a Bavarian-born uh, journalist. Uh, he covered Fremont in 56 and then Lincoln, war correspondent. What was his reportage on Lincoln? What did he uh, do for Lincoln? What was their relationship and how influential was he uh, with his reporting of Lincoln? Well, at first he covered Lincoln in the debates. And although he later remembered that he got to like him, he wrote vicious articles about him for the, for the German papers. And he actually, in Illinois, tried to start a rumor that Lincoln had attended a Know Nothing Lodge meeting which would have been a dispositive thing because uh, that would have hurt him really badly and might have crippled his career. So he was a real anti-Lincoln person. And yet, this is maybe a kind of differ we must kind of tolerance. Mm -hmm. James Gordon Bennett of the New York Herald hired Villard to be in residence in Springfield, to be an embedded reporter during the interregnum, during the secession winter. And he filed report after report, now finally in English, um, reporting on Lincoln, and he went on the, and at first he still doesn't really like him. He tells too many jokes. He's not up to the crisis. Uh, but as the, as that period goes from November to December to January, he becomes more and more impressed with this man. And he becomes not only a reporter, but an advocate for Lincoln's naming more Germans to his administration. He fights for Kerner. He fights for Carl Schurz to get big government jobs. And of course, Lincoln does not satisfy Kerner at first for years because he doesn't want to appoint Illinoisans being the representative in government of Illinois himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are uh, three, three, four uh, characters I just want to mention. Just quickly give uh, a couple of sentences on each. Uh, there's a lot more in the book. Carl Schurz. He plays a recurring role throughout the entire place. What, what is his import with Lincoln? Well, he's a famous uh, resistance fighter in the German revolutions, comes to the United States, goes to Wisconsin, becomes a lawyer and an influential politician. He's all in for William Seward at the convention. And then everyone supports shirts for the cabinet. Lincoln is not ready to appoint a foreign born cabinet member, but he does get a great diplomatic post for him. He becomes uh, the small A ambassador to Spain. Then he doesn't want to go. He wants to raise a regiment. Then he goes. Then he comes back. He raises a regiment. He fights in the war. Not brilliantly, but pretty well, very bravely. And he remains very close to Lincoln. Criticizes him brutally when, when the off-year elections occur in 62 and the Republicans are crushed. 
criticizes Lincoln in 64 uh, for losing the Germ German support, but always comes back, always comes back and speaks all over the country in behalf of Lincoln mm. and just adores him. He's, he's 30 years younger than Lincoln, 25 years younger than Lincoln. And Lincoln liked the man? I think he was very impressed with him, but you know Lincoln. He, he, he and, and who said this, if, as long as we're quoting him, William Herndon, he used people. I mean, he never really had a close friend, but he knew how to deploy the people who admired him. So I think he, he could have cut shirts off several times, but he didn't. So I think he, there was kind of an affection there. Talking about this use of men, you write that Lincoln was, quote, a man who paid his political debts, unquote. Now, maybe I'm reading that incorrectly, but I'm thinking of Orville Browning. Yeah, he didn't well. get the post. Norman Judd didn't get the recognition he felt he should have gotten. Yeah, Norman Illinois, Green, Illinois. Du Bois, Trumbull, Illinois, Stewart, Illinois, all these Illinois, Illinois guys. Wait, he what? can't be nice to Trumbull. Trumbull beat him for the Senate. Mary Lincoln would never have allowed another one. No, he <laughs> was not great. I think it was a big lift for him. That's pretty funny, actually, when he appointed David Davis, the fattest guy in Illinois, yeah, yeah, right. to the Supreme Court, because he didn't want to reward Illinois. He wanted to spread out the largesse. But he does ultimately give Kerner a commission in the army. And ultimately, when Schertz leaves Spain, he appoints Gustav Kerner as ambassador to Spain. So Kerner does get what's then Finally, so. very prestigious. And then he wants to come back and be back in the army. So... These guys were very brave and very tough. He's mean to Kerner, actually. He's, you know, on several occasions, oh, we don't, I don't raise a regiment in Illinois. We have too many regiments. We don't have enough food. It's an embarrassment that you want to raise a regiment. Mm. And then he, he has this idea that Kerner should be a brigadier general under Halleck. Oh. And Halleck, like Fremont before him, they don't want one of Lincoln's friends in there who's going to write letters to Lincoln. So mm. it, it, poor Kerner. He was a devoted... Uh, a devoted, he's one German of the elite political Germans who never abandoned Lincoln. Shirts kind of wavered. Kerner never. Talk about someone writing back to Lincoln. Um, Issachar Zakharai, who was his uh, podiatrist, am I right on that? Um, and I happen to have a letter, which I believe is of his, in which he signs it cryptically the doctor. Oh. So he was out in or New Orleans. So what about that relationship using him to spy on uh, what was happening out there? Yeah, I'm not sure I buy that he was a spy. I know that's um, au courant also. Dr. Zachary was a really, by the way, he was a total fraud. He had no medical training. Right. He plagiarized the book about treating feet. But when he got to Lincoln's feet, when he got to touch them and whatever he did on his corns and bunions, Lincoln had a lot of relief. And then Zachary, uh, I call him Zachary. I don't know how to pronounce his name because it was spelled um, different ways. Right. Um, um, and he's a he's a British Jew, which makes him kind of interesting. The no, he's both I, foreign and British. I mean, you know, and Jewish and Jewish. I mean, like three strikes, you're out. Right. The the anti Semites hated him. They wrote horrible things about him, which I think made endeared him a bit to Lincoln. So he's a successful doctor. But then when he comes back, he says, I want to I want to be the uh, chiropodist, as he called it, which is the old way of saying podiatrist, podiatrist to the army. And Lincoln thought maybe that was a step too far. Mm. And but then he went on these missions, these political missions and the uh, Richmond, New Orleans. And, and Lincoln thought that his usefulness was maybe not so much spying, but getting Jews, core progressives in the South, to begin to accept reunion. I think that's the role he played. And what a character he was. He was self-important, um, you know, sent Lincoln all these gifts from all over the country. At one point he told them, don't worry, the Jewish vote is gonna be for you, which is probably so minuscule it didn't matter. And yeah. there was an uproar in the Jewish press. How dare this con artist say that there's a Jewish vote? Like he was prescient about that, yeah. saying that there was a Jewish vote. But he was in one of these characters. Lincoln had a place in his world, in his life, for everybody. Um, Another and, one that you have in here, we don't have time to really speak about. I just want to know, yay or nay, what you think. Adam Gorowski, a gadfly or no? And did Lincoln feel that way? 
A gadfly, yes, and yes. That's my short answer. Okay. But a useful observer. We love those diaries, right? We yes. love those diaries. And Gorowski published four of them during the war. Yeah. Um, well, it's a three-volume set. Was there a fourth? Maybe three. You know best on this. Yeah, the three volumes. Different publishers. Set. Different publishers. All of them. Tough to get. Uh, another one. I have a few questions I want to get to uh, that are outside the book, but now that I have you, and I think our viewers might like to get something on this, uh, but I do want to ask you about Louis Holsuth. I'm not, I'm not pronouncing that correctly, uh, who is an Hungarian activist. And you write, few politicians could combine savviness and sincerity as being guilingly as Lincoln. So what was that relationship? Quickly. Well, you know, I don't think we ever met Kosuth. He came to the United no, States Grand Tour. Lincoln wrote two sets of resolutions in Springfield, first celebrating Kosuth for his revolt against an autocratic a rule, and then urge, inviting him to Springfield. But we don't think he ever got there. And Kosuth got into trouble during the tour. He talked too much. And this they used to call it Kosuth fever. Everyone wanted to meet him. Everyone wanted to celebrate him. He was the most popular man in America. And then one day... He wasn't. So he got, actually left the country. But it endeared Lincoln to the Hungarians. And, you know, again, it all goes to recruiting. In 1861, there were Hungarian regiments and Hungarian-Italian coalition. That must have been something under the Garibaldi Guard. Well, all of them from 1848 getting, the, yeah. getting out. Yeah. Um, we, you and I, were on, and during the centennial. Bicentennial. Uh, bicentennial. And we're uh, old, but we're not that old. That's right. The bicentennial. We were on a committee for um, four coins, one from each state he was in, plus the district. And I remember when the district one came up, the Treasury came back to us with a image of Lincoln standing next to a cannon. The way he was can he was standing there. To me, it was a lot too phallic. But nonetheless, we didn't like it because it it showed him as a war president. Well, I kind of changed my mind a little bit. Uh, a little late in, in the of, game. Huh? A little late in the game. Well, yeah, but because of the Robertson letter. And I yes. really feel that Zucker had used the Robertson letter in his book and kind of brought me in that, yes, Lincoln was ready for war. He was the first president to be ready for war. Now, he goes beyond me where he thinks that he was in the shadow of Seward and his abolitionism was there and he was ready. He was trying to maneuver war. I don't know about that, but I kind of see him now a bit more as perhaps a war president. With no training. But in terms of your changed mind, you might say that you've evolved. And, and there you go. It's possible. But uh, I, I still think, what did we come up with as the alternative to the canon? I think we also didn't like the design. No, the design, but it was really, I remember succinctly that we didn't like the war part of him. That's not why he came there to- Well, that's to, true. That's true enough. He came yeah. there to to save the Union. That was what he came there for. It's hard but to- he was ready for war, and I'm kind of thinking that, you know? Um, you You mentioned some words uh, of his of Lincoln's that were used against him. We know some of that verbiage. Uh, there were some remarks in Gettysburg that were used against him by Halpine, but there was numerous instances of Lincoln's own words being used against him. Some we know, a house divided, spotty Lincoln, uh, marrying, marrying in the debates whether one would want to marry uh, right. a, a black or not. Is there another one that maybe we don't know about that comes to mind that uh, were words used against him that all of us might learn something? Well, if you look at the press reaction to even the greatest of his speeches at Gettysburg or at the second inaugural, the opposition press always says that his words are ridiculous. I mean, malice toward none is ridiculous. Every drop of blood uh, drawn with a lash to be repaid by one drawn, all ridiculous. Everything he said, we cannot escape history, ridiculous. So all of them are subject to political attack. But if we're close to the end of our talk, 
I want to just, if you let me, I want to just talk about words that are not um, often cited in the Lincoln canon because they're a little bit clumsy, a little bit clumsy, mm -hmm. but they're great. It's Chicago, moreover. 1858, the Tremont House, around Independence Day, 1858. And he has missed a German picnic, which would was a mother load for vote getting. Really dumb. So he goes to give a speech after Douglas speaks the night before at the Tremont House. And he looks into this vast crowd and he sees Anton Hessing, the leading mm -hmm. German politician. Really tall guy. So he's in the crowd. And he looks and he says, we're here to celebrate, and I'm paraphrasing heavily, we're here to celebrate the founders. We salute them, of course, at this time of year and their descendants. You are the heroes of the country. But I look out and see many of you in the audience were not born here or are the children of people who are not born here. And the declaration says that all men are created equal. And that applies to you as much as it does to the founding generation. You are the blood of the blood of the mm. founders, the blood of the blood. Mm. And that just struck me. He did not say that foreigners were poisoning the blood of America, as some do today. He said they were enriching the blood of America. And I think those words, if he had only made them a little more felicitous and edited them, could have been a, a, a major uh, thing we recollect from the Lincoln canon. I think we should recollect them because it applies to like. our day today. He In the Lincoln-Douglas debates in Illinois, he said, I want every Hans and Baptiste and Patrick to have a way into this new country. He said, immigration is something, is a, is a system that Providence has given us to expand our country and to enrich our country. He said that God had willed the war. Here he was also saying God had willed immigration. So he was passionate about it. It just wasn't the top priority. I know, don't pretend that it was the top priority, but it was definitely on his mind. How could it not be? His private secretary, his chief of staff, spoke Nicolai. with a German accent. I mean, yeah. he heard it every day of his life. Well, I think that's a good way to end this book. And uh, there's so much in here. There's no end to it. Uh, <laughs> we didn't get to my favorite guy, Canisius, who uh, every time I say it, I think of Canisius. So uh, it's just a different right. thing for me. But um, it's a wonderful book, people. Thank I you. think you're going to enjoy it. Get a first edition while you can. It's going to go into a second, I would bet. And uh, you'll get this wonderfully signed book plate with Carl Sandburg logo that he gave to Ralph Newman all those years ago when we became Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. Thank you again, Harold. Appreciate your being with us. And um, there we are. Let's do Thank it again for in being Chicago. Here. I'll see you in the spring. Look forward to it. Everyone, you've been on A House Divided here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. When you come around to Chicago, please come in. Uh, we should be open soon when our when the water recedes from being uh, from pipes bursting of, above us a few weeks ago, but we'll be open. So come on in if you come around. Thank you for being at A House Divided. We'll see you next time. Thank you.